podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, everybody. Uh, we'll get started here in a few minutes. I'm going to give everyone another couple of minutes to file in, then we'll, then we'll get the presentation underway. All right, everybody, it's 2 o'clock, so we'll get things underway. I think we've got a, a lot of content today, and we want to have some time at the end to have you ask your questions. So uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's sex session, uh, Sex Offenders and Reentry into Tribal Communities. I'm Travis Johnson, your moderator for today's session. Uh, I'm a grants program associate here at the American Probation and Parole Association, and we are happy to provide you today's webinar through BJA grant funding. Uh, we are joined by Michelle Parks, Associate Director of UND's Tribal Judicial Institute, and by Marnie Dollinger, Senior Policy Advisor in the Office of Sex Offender Sentencing, Monitoring, Apprehending, Registering, and Tracking. A uh, recorded version of this webinar is going to be made uh, in the next few days, so if you guys have to cut out early or want to watch it or want to share it with a coworker, uh, you'll be more than welcome to do it that way. We'll have that posted on, a, on the APPA Tribal Repository website, hopefully in the next day or two. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Feel free to post your questions throughout the session, and we'll designate the last 15 minutes or so to respond to any questions you have. Um, and for those of you joining us, welcome. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to introduce today's speakers that we have. Uh, first, we have Michelle Parks, who is a licensed attorney in the state of Illinois and in the United States District Court for the District of North Dakota. Ms. Parks has background in training and educating tribal, state, and federal law enforcement agencies, as well as attorneys, court staff, and other individuals and entities on a variety of topics relating to the practice of both tribal and federal Indian law. Ms. Parks has an extensive experience working with tribal elected officials, tribal state judges, tribal court personnel, social service programs, vic victim advocacy programs, and other tribal justice officials in the areas of uh, tribal justice system planning, program development, economic development, business law, code development, child welfare, sex offender prosecution, and management of domestic violence. We're also joined today by Marnie Dollinger, who's a senior policy advisor uh, in the Office of Sex Offender Sentencing, Monitoring, Apprehending, Registering, and Tracking uh, for the United States Department of Justice. <clears throat> Ms. Dollinger is responsible for advising state and tribal jurisdictions regarding their implementation of Sex Offender Registration Notification Act, also known as SORNA. Uh, Ms. Dollinger is also a subject matter expert for Native American Sex Offender Management, known as NASM, and the Circles of Support and Accountability, COSA Project. These SMART projects work directly with American Indian tribes as they develop sex offender reentry programs that create a community safety net through accountability and support of sex offenders on tribal lands. She has facilitated forensic sex offender treatment with Native American offenders in civil commitment and trained tribal law enforcement, tribal probation and parole, registration officers, case managers, and therapists on the provision of sex offender specific treatment and risk assessment in Indian country. We will now begin our session, uh, Sex Offenders and Reentry into Tribal Communities, and I'll hand it over to Ms. Parks. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, today we are going to be talking about several different topics, but we are going to begin with an introduction to re-entry and uh, sex offender management in tribal communities. To begin with, we are going to have an overview of today's webinar. Uh, as part of our overview, uh, we just want to let you know a few things that we will be touching upon during today's discussion. And we are going to begin with just a brief introduction to reentry uh, to get us all onto the same page. 
We're going to talk a little bit about SORNA, which is the Sex Offender Registration and Notification Act. Act, uh, to make sure that everybody is familiar a little bit with the act and some of its requirements and how it impacts us in tribal communities and in Indian country. We are also going to have a brief discussion on some of the reentry considerations that might apply to convicted sex offenders who are returning to tribal communities. And then it's going to be, we are going to pass this torch over to Ms. Dollinger, who is going to provide us with a little bit of a view from the field and how some tribes are addressing re-entry issues uh, with respect to sex offenders that are returning uh, to tribal communities. And she will also be providing us with some information regarding some of the training and technical assistance opportunities that are available in this area. So let's first talk a little bit um, about re-entry. When we're speaking about re-entry, uh, just in a very general context, we are really talking about the transition of an offender from a jail or a prison situation back into a community. Um, and Really the goal when we're talking about re-entry is to develop some programs that can provide assistance, resources, and support to offenders who are returning back in the, into the community. And the idea, again, is that we are trying to provide such support to reduce recidivism um, and ultimately to deter future crime and also to enhance community safety within our tribal communities. Uh, when we're looking at re-entry, one of the big things that we know is that, you know, when we're looking at the adjudication of crimes and we're looking at sentencing, uh, jail and fines are often a remedy that is imposed through a criminal court process. And we know that a partial intent for those types of criminal red remedies is to punish the offender for the act that has occurred, but also it is to deter future crimes. And that's really where we're getting at when we're talking about reentry. Um, and Congress has recognized the importance of supporting reentry programs and initiatives with the end goal of reducing recidivism. And we can see that reflected through the Second Chance Act of 2007. That particular piece of federal legislation made federal grants available to governmental agencies and nonprofit organizations in a couple of particular areas, uh, one of which is to support programs that are working to reduce recidivism. So if you have a reentry program uh, that is working to reduce recidivism, that would come within the scope of the Second Chance Act programming. And then also um, those support programs that are working to improve offender outcomes. And talking about offender outcomes, again, we're looking at um, kind of stopping this revolving door and pattern of individuals perpetrating crimes, um, being sentenced to a period of incarceration, being released and then going on to commute to commit future crimes. Our goal is, is that when the sentence is complete, uh, that that individual would be able to be reintegrated into the community and uh, that they would not perpetrate future crimes. So let's talk a little bit about how we can go about reducing recidivism to improve outcomes. And this is really a, a big focus of re-entry. Uh, what we've noted over the years is that there are a lot of times barriers to indiv that individuals encounter when they are reintegra reintegrating back into the community. And by removing some of those barriers or minimizing some of those barriers, uh, we have found that it is um, we are more successful in supporting the transition of that individual from a life of uh, incarceration and into a life of being a, a member of our community that is um, uh, helpful and that is not perpetrating further crimes.
So for most offenders that have been incarcerated, uh, they face some kind of common barriers when they are trying to reintegrate into a community. And so what we have here is a list of kind of some of those really common areas where we're seeing individuals struggle when they are trying to reintegrate. And these are also areas where reentry efforts can focus uh, with a goal of minimizing or addressing. So among some of those barriers, um, employment is a very common one. We oftentimes um, see that individuals who have been released from incarceration have a difficult time um, becoming gainfully employed. And absent some form of gainful employment, that can often be a gateway back into criminal activity. Substance abuse is another area where we're seeing individuals who uh, return to the community may struggle. Uh, this is particularly true if they were a substance abusing offender before they entered uh, incarceration. So, you know, when they come back into the environment uh, where the criminal activity occurred in the first place, uh, removing some of those bar barriers and providing support in the terms in terms of substance abuse counseling and treatment is something something that can be very helpful. Um, housing is another area where we're seeing some some common barriers. Um, this is especially true, I think, with respect to public housing, um, which is, you know, uh, income-based housing. And a lot of offenders, when they are returning to a community, um, they oftentimes are unemployed. They often do not have um, access to housing. And to kind of compound that, there are a lot of times housing restrictions on who is able to live in public housing. And some of those restrictions restrictions may uh, include people who have been violent offenders, it may include people who have uh, drug-related convictions, and also with respect to our discussion today, we're seeing policies emerging that are restricting access to housing for sex offenders as well. Family programming is another area. Um, in the area of sex offenses, uh, you know, a lot of times our mind will go to uh, stranger-based type of crimes where we have, you know, a, an individual who's not known. But what our research and um, statistical data shows us is that the vast majority of sex offenses involve a perpetrating party who is known to the victim and oftentimes is also a family member. And so uh, making sure that there's family programming that is available, not necessarily to reintegrate the individual back into the family, but to provide the support uh, within the community and the family uh, to make sure that um, those family issues aren't compounded or don't result in uh, further offenses when the individual comes back. Mentoring is another area that we see kind of a, as a common barrier. Um, individuals who maybe have at one point been incarcerated and who have successfully reintegrated. Um, historically, there hasn't been a lot of uh, organized uh, services so that those individuals can provide mentoring services to individuals who are recently coming out of an incarceration situation. And so we're seeing reentry kind of focusing on some of that mentoring to help individuals more successfully make that transition. And then, of course, when we're looking at some of the common barriers and reentry, making sure that we have victim support. Um, this is especially true, I think, in the area of sex offenses, because this is a victim-based crime, um, and there are certainly a lot of, there's a lot of trauma surrounding many of these cases, and so making sure that when an offending party is reintegrating into the community, that that victim's voice and safety is paramount is important, not only in terms of some of the barriers that might be facing the individual, but also the barriers that will face that will um, impact the victim when they encounter that individual who is returning to the community. Now, one thing that we do know is that the types of, bar of barriers that exist for an individual offender who is returning to the community is going to vary uh, greatly based upon 
oftentimes the nature of the conviction. Uh, just as I discussed, you know, we may have individuals who are returning with violent crimes or um, maybe individuals who are returning with a substance abuse based crime. Uh, but, you know, recently with the return of sex offenders, well, the return of sex offenders to tribal communities isn't unique, but how we're managing the, that population um, has changed. And what that's brought to light is, I think, the really unique set of challenges uh, that we need to address in terms of reentry for individuals who have been convicted of a sex crime and who are returning to our tribal communities. So to understand uh, reentry needs that are relevant to sex offenders, um, I think it's important that we first take a look at some of the rules and laws that are going to apply to those individuals when they are re-entering our tribal communities. So let's talk a little bit about what sex offender management looks like today and some of the rules and laws that are applicable. The Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act of 2006 is a comprehensive piece of legislation that was uh, passed at the federal level to really address sex, offense, uh, sex offender management in a comprehensive way. Um, now, there were Prior to 2006, there were a number of laws that existed at the federal level that were relevant to sex offender management, uh, but the idea with the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act was to bring those uh, different pieces of legislation under one umbrella in a more comprehensive manner. The law itself was signed into, um, was enacted and, and signed into law by President Bush on July 27th of 2006. And the law itself uh, ha includes several titles. Uh, the, the titles are going to address different um, aspects of sex offender management. But the one that we're really going to talk about uh, in today's webinar is going to be uh, Title I. And Title I talked about and spoke to sex offender registration and notification. And really, it was the first time that we saw Indian tribes or tribal communities specifically referenced in a comprehensive piece of sex offender management legislation. And so this was really pivotal to tribes uh, in taking a step forward through their tribal justice systems and being able to um, get a better local controls on managing convicted sex offenders who were presenting in their tribal communities. Now, under the Adam Walsh Act, uh, there are a number of definitions that are included, and we're not going to go through all of those for today's webinar. But what we are going to talk really quickly about is what will constitute a sex offense under the Adam Walsh Act. So under the Adam Walsh Act, it really kind of set uh, the floor, if you will, and kind of set some basic requirements for jurisdictions to follow if they are going to manage sex offender populations. And this was true also for tribal communities that were developing sex offender registration and management programs. So. The sex offenses that would fall within the Adam Walsh Act include crimes that have an element of a sexual act or sexual contact with another. They will include uh, crimes that are specified against a minor. They can also include federal offenses and military offenses. It will also include a sexual offense that it, um, involves an attempt or conspiracy to commit an offense. And foreign convictions, some foreign convictions and offenses also um, may come within the act. 
And tribal offenses also are included within the act. And that was another important component of the Adam Walsh Act is that, you know, for many years, tribal courts across this nation have been exercising criminal jurisdiction. And that criminal and jurisdiction often included uh, the prosecution of sexual offenses. Uh, part of the problem predating the Adam Walsh Act is that when an individual was convicted of a tribal offense under tribal law and in the tribal court, a lot of times uh, that individual would then move throughout other tribal jurisdictions or maybe even state jurisdictions um, and that tribal court conviction did not historically subject them to the registry laws of other jurisdictions. Now with the Adam Walsh Act we've seen change in that regard. So now we have not only tribes who are registering offenders who are entering their communities, but we also see that individuals who are convicted of sex offenses in tribal courts being subjected to registry requirements outside of tribal communities. And this is an important step, I think, to uh, filling some of the, the the gaps, if you will, in the system of sex offender registration that predated Adam Walsh and uh, certainly lends itself to community safety um, and reduction of recidivism of these types of crimes, both inside and outside of tribal communities and reservations. So I've mentioned that registration is a big component of the Adam Walsh Act. And when we're looking at the registration requirements, the qualifying offenses require that, so if you have a qualifying offense, in other words, you are a convicted sex offender within the sex offenses that are defined either by SORNA or by a tribal code that has substantially complied with the requirements of SORNA, it now requires that an offender register as a sex offender in any jurisdiction where they reside, where they work, and where they attend school. And so for those of you who might be thinking or visualizing a map in your mind and thinking about tribal communities and Indian country and state and local communities, you can start to see how easily it would be for a convicted sex offender to move in and out of tribal communities. And also you can see that there's a, a strong need for collaboration and communication in the area of sex offender registration and management. And that's another area where uh, SORNA has really been beneficial is to improving the communication amongst, jur amongst jurisdictions when an offender is moving from one jurisdiction to another. So uh, with tribal tribal jurisdictions, again, um, if an individual has been convicted of a tribal conviction, a qualifying tribal conviction, they too would be subjected to registry requirements wherever they reside, work, or attend school, whether that be inside of Indian country or outside of Indian country or tribal communities. Okay, we, we don't want to spend our entire time uh, really just focusing entirely on SORNA, but what we did want to do was to kind of give you that, that base and at least an introduction to SORNA and how it impacts um, sex offenses and the classification of sex offenses and then registration. And that really leads us, uh, it's that registration piece that kind of kicks us off uh, to start a discussion on the intersection of reentry and SORNA. Uh, SORNA is a very comprehensive piece of legislation. It includes, as I stated, many uh, requirements that are relevant to the registration of offenders and community notification. Um, but for our discussion, we want to focus in on a couple of real particular registry requirements. <laughs> 
So a couple of the registry requirements that uh, are really important to our discussion on reentry include, uh, first of all, the initial registration requirements. And a part of this, and this is a simplified version, but it requires that an individual who is has been convicted of a qualifying sex offense complete their initial registration uh, either before completion of their sentence or within three working days of a sentence if no jail time is ordered. And so for incarcerated individuals in particular, this is going to be important. And a, a little bit in a couple of slides here, we're also going to talk about some of the complexities that can arise with that initial registration as in a multi-jurisdictional context. Also, all offenders uh, shall be notified of the registry requirement prior to their release from incarceration or immediately after sentencing. So oftentimes uh, what we're finding is that if an individual presents before a tribal court and is convicted of a qualifying offense, they are being informed that at that time that they are required to register as a convicted sex offender by law. This also may occur prior to their release from incarceration. Um, an important component of this also is that when this portion is done, the sex offender that has been convicted is uh, required to read and sign a form that explains their duty to register. And that has some significant impl implications post adjudication for uh, holding that individual accountable if they fail in their duty to register. Okay, so as I talked, uh, mentioned here, there are some complexities uh, that, that arise within tribal communities um, that we don't necessarily see outside of tribal communities. And a lot of that really stems from criminal jurisdiction and how uh, we, the system that has been developed to exercise cr uh, criminal jurisdiction in Indian country. Um, so when we have tribal me members who are Sec convicted sex offenders, they may have been convicted in a tribal court, they may have been convicted in a state court, or they may have been convicted in a federal court. And which court they have been charged and convicted in is going to depend in part on the location of the crime. In other words, did the crime occur inside or outside of Indian country? It's also going to be impacted by the political affiliation of the offender. In other words, is the offending party a tribal member, uh, a non-member Indian, or are they a non-Indian? And then also, uh, is there applicable tribal, state, or federal law? And so uh, that underlying conviction is going to be important for us to understand that uh, if we have an individual who is a tribal member, uh, we can't just assume that they're being convicted in a tribal court. Their conviction may come in any one of those three jurisdictions. Now also that understanding that the conviction may come from one of these three jurisdictions also impacts location of incarceration. So when a, a, an individual is convicted of a sex offense, they may have been um, sentenced uh, to serve jail time and where they serve that jail time can be impacted um, dependent upon which court uh, exercise criminal jurisdiction over them. Uh, for purposes of sex offenders who commit these crimes within Indian country or within tribal communities, they may be incarcerated in a tribal facility. However, uh, what, we're, what we've seen is that many of these individuals are placed into a federal or state detention facility to serve their jail time. And there's a few reasons that that may occur. Uh, it may occur because there's some federal jurisdiction over felony crimes. Uh, it may occur because uh, the tribe is exercising 
a felony level sentencing authority or enhanced sentencing authority relevant to the tribal conviction. Um, and those are permitted by a separate federal law called the Tribal Law and Order Act. And it may also be that uh, the individual has been placed in an off-reservation uh, facility or a facility outside of the tribal community because within the tribal community there is a lack of either a lack of detention facility altogether or perhaps a lack of a detention facility that is sufficient to house an individual on a more long-term basis. So what we're going to see here is that when a convicted sex offender is re-entering a tribal community post-conviction, they may be coming out of a state detention facility, they may be coming out of a federal detention facility, or they may be coming out of a tribal facility. There are some primary obstacles and challenges in terms of uh, post-adjudication um, and re-entry into the tribal community. Some of the challenges and obstacles that we see within our within Indian country and within tribal communities is inability to access necessary services and programs. We're going to talk a little bit more about what that what types of services and programs we're talking about. Um, also, we're seeing some difficulties with uh, post adjudication supervision, and a lot of that comes down to collaboration and understanding roles and responsibilities. And then also, we have a number of multi jurisdictional issues that can arise, and again, a lot of those stem from um, and, and are rooted in criminal jurisdiction and also uh, within locations of incarceration and locations of available services. So in terms of access to programs and services and why we have viewed that as a common obstacle or challenge, um, if you think back to what we talked about earlier in today's presentation, some of the common obstacles we see are in the areas of housing or employment, um, treatment, and in each of these areas, uh, the unique aspect of dealing with a sex offender population comes into play. Uh, with respect to housing, for example, we're seeing a lot of housing entities or public housing entities that are managed by uh, the tribe that have existing laws or policies prohibiting convicted sex offenders from accessing or being eligible uh, to live in public housing. And a lot of times that's uh, to minimize accessibility to children and to, uh, you know, address community safety. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing in this area, though, is that a lot of times the policies are very broad range, are, are very uh, restrictive, and sometimes do not take into account the broad range of sex offenses um, and sex offenders that might be coming uh, into our tribal communities. And, and I just want to make a note of that because as I said, a lot of times when we think of a sex offender, uh, our minds will jump to, you know, the the stranger or the forcible rape or the the really uh, terrible child molestation case. Uh, but I also want to remind everyone that when we are dealing with sex offender populations, we might also be dealing with an individual who was convict, convicted of a sexual offense, um, who was perhaps in a dating relationship where the age disparity between um, the individual convicted uh, and, and the victim was uh, too great. Um, so in some of those cases, you know, some jurisdictions have gone to risk management and they found that, uh, you know, looking at 
the risk or likelihood of reoffense is going to vary across offenders. Uh, with the, the SORNA, there's a tiering process for how long an individual has to register and how frequent uh, contact has to be. And um, a lot of times that tiering of offenses is going to be driven by the na underlying nature of the conviction. So when we're looking at housing and we're looking at employment and we're considering policies and um, the implementations of policies that impact sex offender management, we want to be sure that the individuals who are establishing those policies have a good understanding um, of the population of individuals and kind of the range of the types of sex offenses that may subject an individual to registration. And in doing so, we can work to overcome some of these obstacles for individuals who may not uh, be at a high risk of reoffense. Um, and then in terms of treatment or counseling, I think the same is true here. What we know is that a portion of the sex offender population is not amenable to treatment or counseling um, in terms of completely changing the behaviors or the likelihood of reoffense. Um, that's not to say that treatment or counseling might not be at least of some benefit in uh, managing the population. Um, but when we're looking at Indian country and tribal communities and we're looking at um, uh, the available services for mental health services, for behavioral health services, uh, for treatment and counseling, we know that we have some uh, significant limitations. And when working with a sex offender population, this is really a, a specialized area of treatment. And oftentimes, we're finding that we're lacking access. Uh, when we're looking at post adjudication, or when we're looking at um, post adjudication and supervision also, uh, we're going to have some issues. So with post adjudication supervision, um, again, a lot of times we have individuals who are housed in state or federal systems uh, or facilities, they're returning uh, perhaps after a long term sentence under a felony conviction or under a an enhanced sentencing conviction under TLOA. Um, and a lot of times when they're convicted of those types of offenses, there is going to be a longer term period of post release supervision. And and that may involve um, federal some collaborative effort and communication that is occurring among the jurisdiction also is true for post-incarceration uh, registration, uh, making sure that there's communication between the jurisdictions uh, wherever the individual is residing, working, or going to school. So lastly, uh, on the multi-jurisdictional considerations, um, you know, supervision and registration, uh, again, is often going to involve offenders who are moving from one jurisdiction to another, making sure that we have strong collaboration among the professionals in terms of probation and in terms of those individuals who are administering the registry programs is really important to good supervision and registration. And it's also important so that we don't have uh, systemic challenges or obstacles that are impeding re-entry for offenders. Um, and so making sure that some of those detention facilities, law enforcement, sex offender registration, probation, parole, and I'm going to add here um, also the service providers who, uh, you know, might be able to, to link some services to offenders such as addiction uh, counselors, um, behavioral and mental health providers, that those individuals are talking, are working collaboratively, and are really working out a way to communicate and um, share information and resources to support reentry is going to be really important. And um, so with that said, you know, giving you kind of that background on uh, 
reentry on some of the registration requirements of SORNA and some of the challenges that we might see once an individual has been convicted and served a sentence for a sex offense and is looking back to the community to come back to the community. Um, you know, we've got thinking about that. So now I'd like to turn it over uh, to Ms. Dollinger, who's going to give us a view from the field and uh, provide us some information on what the SMART office has been seeing in their work with sex offender populations uh, with respect to reentry. Re Thank you, Michelle. Um, next slide, please. As Michelle said, I'm Marnie Dollinger and I'm with the SMART office, which is much easier to say than the Office of Sex Offender Sentencing, Monitoring, Apprehending, Registering, and Tracking. Um, we are part of the Office of Justice Programs uh, in the U.S. Department of Justice. And we are the agency that is responsible for the administration and implementation of SORNA, the Sex Offender Registration and Notification Act. Um, Michelle talked all about that, so I'm going to uh, focus on reentry here. Uh, we're also the agency that administers the National Sex Offender Public website. And something I wanted to bring everyone's attention to was the Sex Offender Management Assessment and Planning Initiative, our SOMAPI uh, initiative, which we have up on our website. It is a wealth of information about sex offenders. It has everything from prevention to recidivism. Um, we collected uh, national experts and international experts who wrote articles and did webinars on almost all aspects of sex offender um, treatment, uh, registration, work, reentry, and management. Um, that's all available up on the website. Check it out and um, let us know what you think of it and what else you would like to see from uh, our, our work and what we, you'd like to see up on our website. We're always interested in expanding what we're doing. Um, we're, of course, up on all the forms of social media, so you can follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. Um, you can contact our office to Ask Smart. I'll have my contact information at the end of my session here. Um, and you can also, uh, our NSOPW, the National Sex Offender Public website, is available as an app. So you can um, download that and search for offenders in your area through the convenience of your phone. Technology is amazing. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about, or what we're here for today, is our Indian Country Sex Offender Reentry Initiatives. There are currently 131 um, Indian tribes that have successfully implemented SORNA here in the U.S. And they uh, have worked with us and throughout the years in their implementation of SORNA. And one of the questions that we get most often is about the fact that now that uh, the tribe has their registry up and running and they're checking on offenders and doing supervision in the community, um, what else can the community do to work with the offender in their reentry process and to also um, have the account of the offender be accountable to the community and to work to provide safety within the community. And so with that, we created several initiatives that would address sex offender reentry that was uh, specific to Indian country. One of them is the Native American Sex Offender Management Project, which is NASOM, um, which worked with tribes in the development of reentry programs um, within their communities. And then we also uh, have a project on circles of support and accountability, which is a specific type of reentry and it's a specific type of reentry that works with sex offenders very well. Um, the purpose was we wanted to identify um, who out there is doing this type of work, who has reentry programs, um, how are those programs working, what is working well, what are best practices, uh, what works for juveniles and what works for adults um, out in Indian country and take that information and share it with other tribes. Um, one of the things that we realized early on in this project, we gathered together a, a large working group of experts within this field, within sex offender treatment and sex offender reentry, and um, experts from Indian country, and found out that there was almost no one doing this work, uh, that there were very few opportunities for reentry, and almost no information and research and best practices available to tribes who were seeking to try to find information about how to start a program. And the other thing we wanted to do was identify and develop existing resources within Indian country. So work with tribes and work with tribes where they were at and what they had available at this time that they could um, it, train staff and expand programs to work with sex offenders. And we didn't want to specifically fund reentry programs uh, because one of the things that you find is when 
programs are funded, when the funding ends, sometimes the program will end. And we wanted to develop something that was sustainable and something that tribes could um, do within their communities and it spread that knowledge and spread that information to other tribes so uh, other tribes could then move, it, move forward and, and create rancher programs in their communities. We, of course, when, as I said, we found that there were very few programs out there, that there were some sexual violence prevention programs and some victim services programs, but not really anything that we could find that was um, out there for sex offenders specifically. There were some federal, state, and local uh, programs that tended to be uh, Department of Corrections or Bureau of Prisons based. Um, some maybe had a small cultural component if they had a large number of um, sex offenders from tribal communities, but not very much, and we didn't find very much that was out there. Um, and as with any kind of uh, reentry program that is in a rural community, they were scattered. Um, there's definitely a lack of reentry services that we were finding out there. And if there were services that were offering um, sex offender treatment or sex offender reentry uh, in Indian country, those services didn't have anything that they could share with other communities. And they didn't have kind of that knowledge base built that they could um, share and provide to other uh, um, people who were interested in doing this type of work. Uh, Rural communities in general, not just uh, tribal communities, are, of course, geographically isolated. Um, not everyone, but the majority are. And so what we find is that offenders within those communities, either they are released from prison um, or they come out of a Department of Corrections setting and they go to a halfway house that is not on tribal land, not within their own community. Or if they do return to their community, they often have to travel great distances um, to a, another city in order to receive services. So in looking at these needs, we wanted to identify, um, you know, what was available within their own communities and what would work for them. So we turned to the federal, state, and local resources, the people who were doing this work outside of Indian country, um, and we wanted to see if anybody had a culturally relevant services, services that they'd adapted to, to tribal members, and if they were willing to share and collaborate. And we found some, but not very many um, services or, or resources were out there. And one of the things that we also realized early in this work and in, in working in the area of sex offender reentry and sex offender management is that in order to implement that within your community, you're going to have to begin a community-wide conversation about sexual violence, about sexual violence awareness, sexual violence prevention. And when that happens, when that conversation occurs, it empowers victims to come forward and tell their story. So if you're going to do this work, if you're going to start this discussion within your community, making sure that victim service providers um, are uh, aware that this is happening and are also prepared to meet the needs of people that will then, like I said, be empowered to come forward and tell their stories and to be able to provide services to those people when they do uh, make that step. Next slide. Uh, what we wanted to do is find multi multidisciplinary resources that were already available. So maybe a community had mental health services, behavioral health services, they might have had drug treatment counselors. And so we turned to these folks and asked them, are you willing to work with sex offenders? And it's an important question to ask because sometimes uh, agencies are not. Uh, they might be funded specifically through some type of funding that denies access to people who've committed sexual violence. Um, so then they would not be able to provide services. There are also uh, services that are providing, um, they're providing services directly to victims and sometimes providing to services to a victim and to an offender under the same umbrella um, is difficult to do. But most often the, the challenge that we encountered was that these services are already um, taxed to their limit. They have few resources financially, they don't have enough staff, they have very large caseloads, and asking them to take on another group of clients who are very needy, who need a lot of services, and can be somewhat um, difficult to work with was a, a, an ask too far. So if you're turning to these services to provide additional 
help to sex offenders in the community, then you need to provide additional funding streams to these services so that they can be able to meet some of those needs. You want to identify your strengths and your needs. What does the community need in order for sex offenders to be able to have um, some type of reentry in your community? And you want to have leaders in each of these areas, people who are going to champion this cause because it is an unpopular cause in most cases. Um, in fact, I was actually surprised to some extent. Uh, tribal communities are much more open in general to having um, the discussion about sex offender reentry uh, because f for many communities, um, one of the difficult things to get past is that if you start offering services to offenders, people believe that that is going to then take away services from victims and people would rather have services go to victims than go to offenders. And so making sure that the conversation focuses around prevention of sexual violence and that when you offer services to offenders, when you bring them into a community and make them accountable to a community, uh, they behave safer, they feel like they're part of the community and they want to make safer choices. And that is the basis of sexual violence prevention because the goal of sex offender reentry is to not have any more victims. And then one of the things that we're asking, hoping people will do is collect data and do research. If you are providing sex offender reentry services, if you're working with sex offenders in your community in uh, some type of supervision or management that would be interesting and compelling to other tribes, make sure to write that down, get that information together so that you, you can share that information with other tribes. Whenever I go to speak about reentry um, with tribal members, the first question is, who is doing this work already? What are they doing? And you know, we don't want to have to reinvent the wheel. What works? And of course, we know that in Indian country, tribes are very diverse. They come from so many different diverse experiences and cultures and geographic areas. And nothing is going to be the same. It can't be a one size fits all model. But being able to say, you know, what you did, what your community did and how that worked for you is going to help other tribes be able to develop their own programs. Next slide. Um, so out of this, we created our NASOM pro project um, or program. Uh, what we wanted to do was work with case study tribes who were willing to develop a reentry program. They didn't have a model to follow, so they had to develop programs on their own out of what was going to work for their community and what they thought would work best. And um, we wanted to identify, again, those resources within that community that we could tap into and could provide services um, with training and with experts coming to teach them and to train them on what were best practices and how to do this work and how to make adaptations so that they would fit their culture and their community so that they could build a program that worked specifically for their tribe. Next slide. Um, and so we tried to identify treatment and management uh, services. Uh, you know, it, it's finding people who are doing work that is close to this and training them. But sometimes you get surprised. Uh, we found within one of the tribes communities that we were working with, they had a certified sex offender treatment therapist who was providing drug and alcohol counseling in their um, community. That was an amazing thing to find. The uh, folks who have that type of training are, are very rare. Um, so, and the tribe wasn't even aware that this uh, person had these credentials and had this experience. So it was, you know, opening yourself up to trying to find what is available and what are some of the resources that you can use. Um, take the existing tools that are currently being used uh, and then adapt them to other, cult or other cultures, adapt them to your community. Um, Reentry services tend to be based on the outpatient uh, Department of Corrections model, um, but there are some services that seem to fit a bit more naturally with um, Indian communities and in tribal communities. Um, that's the COSA model, which is a type of a reentry program, which I'll talk about shortly here. Um, but it's identifying what is going to work for your community. And then one of the things that we asked our NASOM tribes to do was to work with us in developing um, resources for other tribes. And we don't have any of those available yet, but we're hoping to have them put together um, so that they'll be available up on our website in the future so that tribes can look at them and get ideas of how to start doing some of this work. 
Um, every tribe that we work with decided that the first place to start was to have a community training. They wanted to let their community know what they were doing, which is a great idea. Um, so having community meetings uh, scheduled where we met, they met with the experts who were going to be doing the training and they met with the people who were going to be developing the reentry program so everybody could ask questions, everybody could learn about it. It was also a way to develop volunteers, people within the community who might be interested in doing this work. It was a way to include victim services so victim services could talk about how they were going to provide for community members and make sure that everyone's needs were met. Um, and bring in other services. You want to have your behavioral health, you want to have your drug counselors, employment and housing, you need law enforcement, um, making sure that tribal judges and prosecutors know what you're doing and know how to um, work with offenders who are in these programs or how to make these programs um, something that offenders might want to do. Um, and then also understanding that you're working with small communities and small communities, of course, have their own rules, their politics, their cultures and communication strategies. And you want to tap into those communication strategies and get into that grapevine where you can talk with people who are then going to spread the word um, and the, the, the type of um, good buzz that you want out there about how, what you're going to be doing and how this is going to ben benefit the community and make the community safer. The four tribes that we worked with were the Menominee Nation out of Wisconsin, the Oglala Sioux Tribe on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, the Cheyenne and Arapaho Tribes in Oklahoma, and the Pueblo of Isleta in New Mexico. And they are all um, currently working on their reentry programs and at different stages of development in those programs. And for these tribes, the things that they identified that were important um, were looking at their own tribal codes to see if there were ways that they could either adjust the code to make it uh, more likely that offenders would want to go into their reentry programs, um, ways to expand their sex offender registration to include some type of reentry, some type of community accountability um, as part of that, also that community notification that's part of SORNA. And then some tribes have restrictions that go beyond registration. So maybe they have restrictions keeping people from attending cultural services, uh, powwows, from you know being in certain areas of their community and how they can kind of strategize those restrictions and strategize their reentry program so that if somebody is doing well within their reentry program, that might be a way for this person to um, show that they're making safe choices, be accountable to the community and to kind of earn back some of those privileges and being able to come back into the community in a, in a more of a uh, full participation than where they were at before. Um, and another thing is to look at what type of participants do you have? Um, do you have any offenders that are being supervised currently? Can your reentry program be included in part of their supervision plan? And it's important for the community to kind of look at ways that they can compel participation because mandating someone to treatment doesn't really work and especially doesn't work in the area of sex offender treatment. Sex offender treatment works when an offender is interested in making different choices. They need to live their life differently and they need to um, focus on what made them unsafe in the past and change how they interact with their community, how they interact with friends, family, strangers, in order to um, control offending, in order to um, change their behavior. And that is uh, it's something that a person has to be willing to do. They have to want to take that step. So being able to compel people to come into the program, to get interested in the program, and then to kind of move forward more fully into how to make those behavioral changes that are going to keep them and their community safe for a lifetime. And then the other thing to look at when you're dealing with participants, um, not just the offenders, but if you're going to be working with a model that requires community mentorship or community volunteers, if you have a small pool of volunteers, or you have a small community where everyone is related, everybody knows each other, how are you going to bridge that gap into working with the offenders in a way so that the people who are working with them directly know that they don't keep secrets from each other and that they can share information and make sure that everybody is on the same page and the same team working with that offender, 
but then also not sharing that information with the community um, as in the form of gossip or anything like that. So it's some of the things that you know you always deal with when you're working with small communities is how to make sure that everybody who needs to know needs to know and everybody who doesn't needs doesn't need to know um, you know is aware of the program but doesn't need to know all the all the details of what the uh, what the offender is doing at that specific time. So along those lines, um, one of the things that we wanted to look at was a specific type of uh, reentry program that seems to work very well with sex offenders. The SMART office has funded COSA funding and COSA programs throughout the U.S. and we wanted to specifically focus on a tribal communities and see how COSA would work with tribal communities. Um, and it's circles of support and accountability. So what COSA is, is a program where you have a sex offender who is a volunteer, they're a core member of a circle. And then within that circle, you have a COSA coordinator, somebody who runs the circle. You maybe will have their treatment provider or their probation agent. And then you have volunteers from the community who are willing to work with that offender. They mentor them, they provide support, but they also provide accountability and safety for that person. So they are kind of that person's sounding board of how to make good choices, how to talk about their life and their day and, and their activities in a way that will hold them accountable to being safe and making safe choices, but then also provide them some support and somebody who that the person is accountable to. Because of course we know that offenders who feel like they're not accountable to anyone um, tend to make the more dangerous choices, tend to commit more sexual harm than people who feel like they're a part of a community. So bringing, these, bringing offenders into the community helps in that primary prevention. It helps in keeping them from reoffending in the future. COSA came out of um, the Canada in the 1960s. It began with uh, the First Nations communities up there in Canada, and it's based on the idea of the, the Native American talking circle. And it has the core principles of no one is disposable, no one does this alone, that there'll be no more victims, and that the community is responsible not only to victims, but to offenders as well, and to hold those offenders accountable and to also work with the, the victims in the community to bring those offenders back into the community. We put out a solicitation for two tribes, but we only had one that applied. It was the Pueblo of Santo Domingo in New Mexico, also known as the Kiwa. Um, they are a small traditional community, and for them, COSA seems like a natural fit. Um, they liked the principles of COSA, and they thought it would fit with their community. Um, they have offenders who are already living within their community, and it's a small, close-knit community. So being able to work with them in a different way, being able to bring them into the community in a different way was something that was very important to them. Next slide. So they started small with one group. I think they're up to about three circles right now. Um, and as the benefits of COSA are getting out there, as the offenders are talking about what is working well for them and what they like about the circles, um, it's involving more of the offender population, more people are wanting to get involved. And that is one of the things that they were looking for for their end goals was to um, involve all of their offenders. And then maybe even um, because COSA is not just exclusive to sex offenders, but look at it as a, a general reentry strategy for their community. Uh, for the SMART office, our future Indian Country Reentry initiatives, um, one of the things that we wanted to make sure people were aware of is that we have funding for training and technical assistance, um, that mostly for SORNA implementation, but we also want to work with tribes that are interested in expanding beyond sex offender registration that want to start looking at um, their community and how they can make their community safer and how to do some of these um, reentry uh, do some reentry work and make some changes that are more about how to manage offenders in the community. So we are seeking additional tribes that are interested in um, developing COSAs and you can contact us about that. We would want to have tribes that are coming on board who have uh, most likely implemented SORNA so they have an existing registration system that's ready to go. Um, they tribes with administrative support. So make sure that um, you know the people uh, in the administration side of the, the tribal agencies would want to participate in this. 
have some type of um, leadership available, people who would be willing to champion this cause. And then think about whether or not your community would be willing to provide uh, volunteers or, or is, if there's any kind of existing volunteer pool or a way to tap into um, getting people involved into the program. And then also being willing to um, commit to learning about the COSA model and receiving training and then being able to adapt the COSA model and adapt the training in order to be able to meet your own community's needs. So here's my contact information. Um, so please contact me if you are interested um, in either uh, sex offender reentry or um, further expansion beyond a sex offender registration in your community. SMART has many resources available to assist you. Um, and if you are a sex offender um, treatment provider or sex offender reentry program out in working in tribal communities now, please contact me because we would like to find out who is doing this work, what are the best practices, and to be able to take that knowledge and share it with other tribes and, and other communities. Um, so if you are out there doing this work and we haven't found you yet, please, please contact us um, because we would like to uh, share your knowledge with as many people as possible. Right, and well, with that, um, oh, sorry. That's all right. Um, I was just going to thank you, Ms. Dollinger and, and Ms. Parks, for your presentations. And if anyone had any questions, uh, we'll leave it open here for a few minutes. Just type those into the chat, and I'll get them uh, read to the, the faculty, and we'll try and get you guys some answers if you have any questions. Uh, as of now, we don't have any, any have any questions, so I'll just I'll, I'll read this in case someone does. Um, I just like I was saying, I'd like to thank Michelle Parks and, and Marty Dollinger for taking time out of their day to, to help us do this webinar today. And to thank you, the participants, for your responses and for attending the webinar. And uh, we'd like to extend an invitation to you guys for our next webinar, which will be on July 26th at 2. And that will be How to Access Resources, presented by B.J. Jones, who is also from the Tribal Judicial Institute at UND. Uh, Hopefully we'll send the information out in the next few days, kind of how we did this one. It'll just be through an email blast where everyone can sign up. And uh, we still don't have any questions, and I think we've got a few minutes over, so if you guys are comfortable, we'll just uh, we'll call it in there. Okay, sounds good. One of the things I wanted is at the end of the slides here, there's actually a couple slides that have some resources for the SMART Office, Office of Justice Programs, um, that would you know, possibly take a look at it and see if there's any uh, – funding streams there that might be available to you for assistance. And then the next page just has some national resources on a reentry and sex offender specific work. So if anyone wants to check those out, uh, definitely do that. All right, well, I appreciate everyone's attendance today. And, uh... I'll put this PowerPoint on YouTube for people that are asking for the PowerPoints, and then I'll also uh, email it to whoever wants it. Just send me a message, and I can, I can attach it to, to an email for you guys.